Welcome, everyone. Appleton Community Evangelical Free Church, our Sunday uh, video recording. And uh, as we uh, continue on, we started last week, or we restarted in looking at the statement of our faith, our statement of faith, what we believe as a church. And we're uh, still this week, last week, this week and next week, we're looking, looking at the ministry and the ideas, the beliefs, the, the truths that we believe about God's Holy Spirit. And uh, we're thankful that we have the Holy Spirit. I just thought for a moment ago, I, I, I cannot do this without the help of God's Holy Spirit. When I try to do this without looking to God and asking Him for the help that I can receive from His indwelling Spirit, um, uh, it, 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 that changes the way in which this comes across. Now, I admit, there are many weeks when I get done and I think, well, is it going to be okay? Is that the, what I desire? And uh, I don't claim to be uh, someone that, um, you know, uh, I just want to do my best for God. And I know that uh, as we look into God's Word, we always need to allow God to, to lead us, God to direct us, I, uh, God's Spirit to, to help me and to be clear and, and to be able to express things in a fashion that is um, going to help those that listen and encourage. I, I, I want that. I want God to be honored in all of it, too. So, all right. I chattered a lot this, the, today and, and as I got started. Let me pray as we start, and then we're going to dig in with some thoughts about the Holy Spirit. Father God, I thank you for your, your, your presence here with me right now. I thank you that your Holy Spirit it literally lives inside of my life. And in, li in the life of every person who knows Christ as, as Savior and Lord, thank you for that reality. Thank you for that truth. Uh, help us to continually uh, remember that and to rely upon that. And I pray that we would allow your spirit to uh, guide, to guard, and to uh, be the, con the controlling influence over our lives. Help us in that, Father. I do pray for those matters. I pray for people today that are struggling. I know there are many that are facing challenges or difficulties. Maybe they be maybe their work challenges, maybe their personal needs, maybe their medical circumstances, maybe they're just a, a, a myriad of other different various things, Father. And I know there are people that, that have concerns. And I pray today that you would minister to all of those. I pray for uh, Lavila Rice, as I know her desire is to uh, go home and to, to be in glory as soon as possible. And, and I know that there's been a medical decision made. There have been some uh, concerns expressed. And, and I just pray that you'll help Lavila, help her family, encourage them as her home going is going to be very soon. I, I pray, too, Father, for others that have various challenges and needs that are part of our fellowship, our congregation. Um, use what I explain and express today, Father, from Romans chapter 8 to provide encouragement, to provide a sense of understanding in our lives of what you're doing in, uh, in us on a consistent basis and what you desire from us as we seek to live for you and honor you, Father. Help us in that. Help us to be submissive to your spirit. Again, I pray your Spirit will communicate through me today. I pray that the Spirit will help those that are listening and hearing. And I ask that in the end, Father, that you'll receive honor, glory, and praise for all of it. Thank you for Romans 8. Thanks for the Apostle Paul. Thanks for the Bible. Thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ. He came. He became a man from heaven and uh, paid a price, a heavy price, that he didn't deserve to pay. And we thank you for that. And we pray this all in his wondrous, powerful, precious name, in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. As I get started, a couple of illustrations, a couple of uh, things that um, relate to what I'm trying to explain today. Uh, I'm mindful of actually a time when I was probably about four or five years old. 
my mom and dad, they, they took our family. We went to a festival. In fact, it was called the Moments Gladiola Festival. I grew up in a community that gladiolas were the number one cash crop in the area where I grew up. And every year they had this festival in August uh, that uh, focused in on, on all the beauty of gladiola flowers. And, and there were many activities that were there at the festival. There was a carnival and everything else. And uh, we were walking together as a family, and somehow I got separated from my mom and dad. I was a youngster, four, maybe five, and got separated. And it's interesting, here I am, uh, 60 many, 64 years later, and I still remember the scared feeling that I had, that sense of insecurity I had when I realized I don't know where my mom and dad are. There's crowds all around me. There's people here. I started running one way and looking for them, and I ran another way and looked for them. And actually, to this day, I don't remember exactly how I found them or how they found me. I don't know. I just remember the fearful feelings, the insecurity that I had. And I remember for the rest of that day, I don't think I ever let go of my mom or my dad's hand, either one of them. I mean, I didn't have both their hands all the time, but it didn't let go. Why? Because I, I experienced that sense of insecurity and, and, you know, it affected me. And I, I wonder sometimes as we live in this world today, how much does insecurity, how much does fear, how much does it affect our daily activities, our daily lives. How much does it affect our mindset and our thoughts? Because fear is something that we all face, and fear is something that our brain remembers. So I, I give that first illustration. Second illustration, when my sister was in the sixth grade, I remember this very clearly because I was on a I was on on the basketball team, and we were in a basketball tournament, and I was coming back on the bus. And um, from the tournament, and I got to the to back to the school, and my mom and dad weren't there to pick me up. In fact, my aunt was there to pick me up, and you know that's what I remember. But my sister and my mom, they were in an accident, in an automobile accident, where a car slid on some ice and broadsided their car, and they hit the passenger side, and my sister. She was injured very seriously in this accident. Her leg was broken. She was in the hospital for several days. She had to have surgery. And I recall that after that accident, for a long period of time, my sister had a sense of anxiety over icy roads, slippery pavement. That was something that caused a bit of fear in her. Why? Because she'd been injured. And there's that sense of insecurity. And I think we all recognize that. So as I continue on in looking at this, I wonder again, how much does fear, insecurity, worry, how much does that affect our mindset? How much does that influence the way we live our lives, the way that we act? And what is God's answer for us in the whole area of insecurity? We live in a world where there are many challenges. We read the, the newspaper. We look at the news on TV. We hear news on the radio. And it's very rarely good news that we hear. It's oftentimes challenging news. We hear about the bad things that are happening in the world. You know, good news doesn't sell very quickly. You know, and that's, they, they, you know they, don't, they don't focus on the good news. They focus on what are the events that will draw people's attention. And what does that do? That raises that sense of insecurity that we all sometimes, we have to deal with that in a, in a, in a way that, that how do we bring God into the picture? How do we, we respond to things without living life in the, the significant amount of fear that sometimes drives us to a point of we're not doing what we ought to do or we're not living the way we ought to live? And this, in, in this message today, what I want us to see, Romans chapter 8, long passage, I'm not going to be able to read the whole chapter, but I want us to realize that God provides for us the Holy Spirit to relieve our insecurities. God wants us to be able to trust Him and to live by the guidance 
of his spirit that lives inside of our lives. His spirit helps us remember. We looked at this last week, John chapter 13, four, John chapter 14, 15, and 16. We saw where the Holy Spirit brings to our minds the truths that Jesus taught, brings to our minds the Bible verses that we've memorized, brings to our minds the truths that Scripture shows us to help us and give us hope, to give us a sense of, of certainty, a sense of assurance. And the Holy Spirit is, is what God provides for us to deal with our insecurities. And I want to point out our emphasis today, our emphasis when we look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 teaches us that God gave all faithful followers of Christ, every one of us who's trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He's given His Spirit to us to provide us with security, with strength, with supervision, he watches over us by, by the power of the Spirit, and he gives us a sense of stability. All S words, security, strength, supervision, and stability. He gave all faithful followers of Christ that. And I want to point, point out at the very beginning of this message, if you're watching today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the one that came and died on the cross for sin, if you've never done that, realize that you're missing out on the blessing of God's presence in your life, God's Holy Spirit living in your life, God's Spirit giving you that sense of security, that sense of strength, that sense of supervision, and that sense of stability. And that's something that we want, I want us to see. Hey, I can put the card up on the screen for just a second. His Spirit provides for us security, strength, supervision, and stability. And I want us to realize that Romans 8 is teaching us that truth. Now, three questions. I've given those illustrations before of how certain events that took place, how they brought about a sense of, of fear, a sense of question, a sense of doubt, a sense of worry, a sense of anxiety. And I'm going to ask these three questions. These are similar to questions that I asked last week. But the first question, how much or how, or how often does insecurity and worry disrupt or distract my ability to function effectively? This morning, I woke up early. I had a lot of things on my mind, a lot of things that I was planning to do today. This is one of those things I was thinking through my message and I couldn't get back to sleep. Was that insecurity? Was that a worry? Maybe a bit of it was. Yes, these things were on my mind and they were important, but I needed to cast those cares and those concerns over to God, and I shouldn't let that disrupt or distract my ability to sleep or my ability to think of other things I need to do. Same thing for you. There may be things that you allow to disrupt or distract your ability to function effectively. And we can rely on God's Holy Spirit to help us in those areas. Secondly, how often do I recognize God's personal presence in my life? Or, to phrase that in a different way, how often am I trying to do things so much on my own that I don't even stop and consider that God has provided for me His Holy Spirit? I don't stop and consider that God is there watching, that God is there listening, that God knows everything that goes on in my life. God's personal presence, that is a tremendous blessing. We saw last week where Jesus said to his disciples, I'm leaving and that's to your advantage that I go because if I leave and go, I will send my spirit who will dwell in your life and provide for you security, provide for you strength, provide for you supervision, provide for you that sense of, um, uh, of, of stability. <laughs> I had a look. Uh, but you know what? That's, but so the, how often do I recognize God's personal presence? And then thirdly, how regularly or how often do I submit to the guidance of God's Holy Spirit? Am I doing what God's Spirit tells me to do? Sometimes I may be watching something on television. I may be looking at the clock and say, hey, I need to go do something else. Maybe God's Spirit is prompting me, prompting me to 
call somebody or to make a, a contact of some sort. Maybe I need to go and, and finish something that I'm planning or preparing for ministry. And yet, I'm watching television. Or maybe I'm doing something else. And the Spirit is prompting me. The Spirit is guiding me, saying, Greg, it's time to do something else. Am I willing to submit to what the Spirit is telling me to do? Or am I going to do what I desire to do? Or what I think I, I would you know, like to keep doing? And I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, is that an issue for our lives? Am I submitting to the guidance that God's Spirit provides for my life? Now, as we look at the message today, Romans chapter 8, I'm calling this, and there, there's another name on the sermon notes, I realize, and this is also in the notes, but these are three no's we need to know to help our faith to grow. A lot of O oh in there. Three no's we need to know to help our faith to grow. And I, I want us to see that, but, or we can call it something else. We can call it recognizing, rejoicing, and relying on the resources we've been given by God's Holy Spirit. That's what Romans 8 is all about. We need to recognize, we need to rejoice, and we need to rely on the resources that God's Spirit provides for us. And there are going to be, as I said, three no's we need to know to help our faith to grow. And the first no is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. The life-giving Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, sets us free from the penalty that we all deserve to pay for sin. Any and every one who is in Christ... I've trusted in Christ. I've, I've relied on Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for my sins. Anyone who is in Christ has freedom and forgiveness. There is no condemnation. That is a blessing that we have. Notice what it says, Romans 8, the first eight verses. I'm going to read those. I said I wasn't going to read the whole passage. There are sections I will not be able to read because of the time element. And I, I, I want to, to, to read the highlights. And, and Romans 8 starts off and Paul says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life, or basically the, the plans and purposes of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the plans, the purposes of of sin and death that are involved in, 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 you know, the law tells us the wrong things, the things that will lead to death. The law tells us that. We go on, verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as, as though it was, through the, fe through the flesh, through our, 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 our human lives, God did sending his own son in, in the image and the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not a sinner, but he was a human being. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He died to condemn sin. He died as a human being to condemn sin. So the requirement of the law might be fulfilled for us who do not walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the Spirit. For those, for those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. But those who are living according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things related to the Holy Spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is death, but the mind that is set on the Spirit is life and peace. Notice, life and peace gives us peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It's an enemy of God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not able to do so. And those who are in the flesh can never please God. Romans 8, 1 through, 1 through 8. And what we see there is he says that, that again, the life-giving Spirit of God... The life-giving Spirit of God has set us free 
from the penalty for sin. Anyone, everyone who is in Christ, who's trusted in Christ, we are covered by Christ, his death on Calvary. He paid the penalty for our sins. We have freedom and forgiveness. But we realize is the law, the do's and the don'ts, what the law could never do, the law was never given to save. The law was given to condemn. What the law could never do, God did. He did it how? By sending his own son to die on the cross. What it says in that chapter, Romans 8. He defeated, he condemned sin through his death and his resurrection. He was victorious. And he fulfilled God's righteous requirement. He never sinned. He never did anything that was wrong. And therefore, Jesus Christ provides for us what only can be provided for us through the, the perfect life that Christ lived and the perfect death that he died on our behalf, in our place. And when we start to think, well, I can, I can please God by doing this, or I can may God love me more by doing this or whatever else, we're fooling ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. It says very clearly, clearly verse 8, no one can ever please God on their own. We saw last week in John 15, verse 5, apart from Christ, apart from the Spirit of Christ, we can do nothing that would have eternal value. We can do nothing that would please God. We can do nothing that would be satisfactory of saying, okay, God is, is, is able to use that for, for what he needs to do in this world. You know, no one can ever please God on their own. And what we need to realize is that grace, we're saved by grace. We are provided the pardon for sin by grace. God's pardon from sin for us it's only by grace. And we understand here the life-giving Spirit, the Holy Spirit that brought Christ back from the dead, as it says in this passage. The life-giving Spirit gives us life. We are born sinners who are dead because of our sin. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we trust in Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit guides us. We, tr we place our faith in Christ as the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And the life-giving Spirit provides for us the pardon we need from sin. And it is a gracious gift. We never earn that on our own. We never deserve that on our own. That's a blessing. That is a benefit from God. That is a wonderful, positive benefit from God. And it's important for us to realize the Holy Spirit is involved in that process. The life-giving Spirit, He brought Christ back from the dead. The life-giving Spirit brings us back from the death that we, we, we have because of sin, but the Holy Spirit gives us life, the life-giving Spirit. And we please God by allowing the Spirit to take control of our lives, by allowing the Spirit to lead our lives. And I think it's important for us to realize that we have no condemnation. I never have to worry about being condemned. I don't have to worry about paying for my sin why? Because Christ paid for it. No condemnation. Therefore there, is there, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I think it's key that we realize that and we understand that. So no condemnation. That's the first no that we need to know. But the key thing is, is God's pardon from sin it's nothing we ever earn. It's nothing that we ever deserve. It's something that we are given, we are granted by God's mercy and grace. It's unearned. It's undeserved. God gives that to us through the power, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But secondly, verses 9 through 28 of Romans 8. And I'm not going to read all of that, but I'm going to read sections of it as we go through 
That's the second no. And therefore, we should realize that we have no doubt. We have no condemnation. We will never be condemned. Jesus Christ was condemned for us, so we never have to face condemnation. And therefore, he teaches us in Romans 8, 9 through 28, some very powerful teaching there from the Apostle Paul, that we should live our lives with no doubt. We have no doubt. I know where I'm headed. I'm headed for heaven because Jesus Christ, he, he, he paid the price. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven after I pay the price for your sin. John 14, we looked at that last week. We have no doubt. The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, He resides in you and me. If we've trusted in Christ, He lives inside of our lives. And, and we see that in this passage. Follow as I read some sections of this. It says, However, you are not in the flesh, but rather you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, an illustration I was going to give at the beginning, but I'm, I'm shifting it now. I, I listen many Saturdays to a friend of mine that has a call-in radio program, and it's a Bible answer program. And he has this call-in program, and I'll guarantee that almost every single week there will see, be someone that's going to call in, and they're going to ask him to explain to them, how can I be certain that I'm going to heaven? Almost every single week that question is asked. How can I know for sure? People have doubts. Have I lost my salvation? I sinned this week. I did something really wrong, and... I, suddenly I have doubts. I have fears. I wonder, did I lose my salvation? Can I lose my salvation? This passage in Romans 8 teaches us absolutely we can never lose our salvation. We'll explain that as we move farther through the passage. But, you know, he says, you're, in the, you're not in the flesh, but rather you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead, you know, we are dead because of our sin. Ephesians 2 teaches that. Other passages teach that. Romans 8 is teaching that. We are dead because of our sin, and we need the Spirit of God to raise us up from the dead through Christ, through trusting in Jesus Christ. But he says... Um, but if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the, Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. The spirit gives us life. So then, brothers and sisters, we are under obligation not to the flesh, not to the lusts of the flesh, not to the desires of the flesh. Now, many times we can be tempted we can be distracted. Our lives can be disrupted because, well, I desire to do something I shouldn't do. I, I, I don't stop and realize this isn't something that honors God. And sometimes we will fall under the temptation or the question of, what if I do something that's wrong? He says, brothers, we're under obligation, but not to the flesh. The flesh should not control our lives. The lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh should never control our lives, but rather we are under, under obligation to the Spirit. For if you are living according to the flesh, it says you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. He's explaining there the spirit of, 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 of the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of our lives if we trusted in Jesus Christ. And the question is, how do I know for sure? Well, we know for sure because the spirit is guiding us. The spirit is prompting us. The spirit is leading us. And he says very clearly there, if we have the spirit living inside of us, it says we belong to Christ. 
If we have the Spirit inside of us, we belong to Christ. Now, how do we know if we have the Spirit inside of us? Well, the Spirit will prompt us. The Spirit will speak to us through the teaching of Scripture, through the reminder of what the Scriptures say. And he's saying here, he says, we are under an obligation. We're not under an obligation. We should not be under the obligation to follow the desires of the flesh or to get involved in sin. We're under an obligation not to our own desires, but to the guidance of the Spirit. We are under obligation to the guidance of the Spirit. The Spirit came to live inside of us, and He places us under His authority. And we live under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we also live under obligation to the glory or the reputation of God our Father. We're part of God's family. Now, I want to say a couple of things that are in this passage here. He says that we, if, if, we're, if we're living according to the flesh, if we're living according to the desires of the flesh, if we're being controlled by sin, he's saying we need to destroy that sin. We need to kill that sin. And I think it's important that we realize that we need to look at the various areas of weakness in our lives, those areas of sin in our lives, and we need to say, hey, I need to cast that away. I need to, to die to that desire. I need to live according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And as I said earlier, we are under obligation, not, not obligation to our own desires, those sinful desires that still they, they, they sometimes control our minds, but rather we're under obligation to the guidance of God's Holy Spirit and also to the glory or the reputation of our Father. It says, it, you know, he says, um, if you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, see, that I said before, that fear, that anxiety, that insecurity, that worry, we're not, we're not, we don't have a spirit of, of slavery that pulls us under fear. Now, the world wants to pull us under fear. But it says, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. We realize God in heaven is our Father. And this is the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we, we experience the sufferings like Christ experienced, the world turns its back on us. The world doesn't understand us. The world tends to hate us. We face the sufferings of Christ. But yet Paul says in this passage, the sufferings we face, the challenges of this present time, they are nothing compared to the glory that awaits us in heaven. And as I go back to this card again, as I show this again, we are under an obligation not to follow our desires. We need to say, my desires, they need to be, they need to be directed by God's Holy Spirit. They need to be under the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. And I'm also under an obligation to the glory or the reputation of God's, God my Father. The Spirit came to live inside of my life so that I would give honor and glory to God. I would enhance God's reputation. I would live for God's glory and honor. And the Spirit motivates us. The Spirit motivates us basically to live like God's children. The Spirit motivates me and you, you and I, all of us. He motivates us to live like God's children and also, we have that sense where we are living with an eager hope. We're living with an eager hope, waiting for heaven. It says in the passage here, we are looking forward to the adoption, or actually, we are waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. In hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he's already seen? 
But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. Now, I, 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 I'm going to say this, and I, I, I just believe that as I look at that passage, I believe that God, His plans and purposes for the future, His promises for the future for us, Jesus says, Behold, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and receive you to myself. Jesus is coming back, and in any day now he could come, and he could say, the trump could sound, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2. You know, Jesus Christ could come and could gather us in the clouds and take us to glory. That's something we long for. I mentioned a lady in our church that is, that is desiring to, to go home and be in glory. She is looking for it. I remember when my dad passed away. He said to me one day, he says, Greg, he says, my life is, is over. He says, it's time. I look forward to, 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 to meeting my Savior face to face. We eagerly await. There comes a point in time we realize where heaven is waiting for us and we're waiting for heaven and that is going to be better than anything we face here on earth. And we need to realize that the Spirit motivates us while we're here on earth to live like God's children. We're adopted into God's family. We represent God's family to a world around us. But we also see in this passage as we read on, it says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There are times when we say, oh, there's so much going on. What do I say in prayer? How do I pray for this? What do I ask next from God? And the Spirit intercedes for us. The Spirit gives us an understanding. And God's Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know what to pray. And therefore, the Spirit points us toward God's plans and purposes. The Spirit helps us. The Spirit intercedes for us. The Spirit guides our prayers. The Spirit lives inside of us, and He guides us. He directs us, and He points us towards God's plans and purposes. Sometimes we pray, and sometimes we pray for various things that we would want. And we sometimes don't consider, what's God's will? There may be sometimes we're praying for things that we ought never ask. And the thing is, we should realize God's Spirit directs us to pray for God's plans and purposes. I pray each day, God, if this is the day when Christ would come back, may that be your will. I, I pray every single day, help me honor you, Father. Help me give you glory. Help me do what you desire me to do. God's Spirit intercedes for us and helps us to pray for things that point towards God's plans and purposes. They point towards God's glory. And that's all involved in what the Spirit is doing in our lives. But as we consider this, as we look at this, let's realize God's presence in this passage, Romans 8, God's presence, it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed now. We looked last week, John 14, 15, 16. Jesus says, I'm going to send my spirit. He'll be with you forever. God's presence came into our lives the moment we trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. And his spirit came and lived inside of us. And that's a guarantee. God is always there for us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But now last, the third no. There is no separation. There is no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation, but there's also no separation. We can never be separated from the love of God, which was demonstrated to us through what Christ did for us. Let's follow along as we read. And we see here, I read verse 28. This is a favorite passage of many, many people. It says, and we know. We are aware, we trust, we believe that God orchestrates all things to work together for good for those who love him, for those who are called to follow his plans and purposes. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, 
that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these whom he predestined, he also called. Though these whom he called, he also justified. These whom he justified, he also glorified. And what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? I'm going to pause my reading there. This passage is describing the various promises that God has made. You trust in Christ, you will be saved, you will be sanctified, you'll be set apart, you'll be, you'll be made holy, you will be declared righteous, you're justified, you're declared to be righteous. The judge says he is in Christ. He is righteous in Christ. And we see these promises, and God promised that His Holy Spirit, two things, is prompting our actions and activities. The Spirit is prompting us. The Spirit is guiding us, telling us what we should and what we shouldn't do. And, you know, we know that God orchestrates all things for what's best. That is saying God's Spirit is prompting us. God's Spirit is helping us. We should follow His Spirit and we will do the good things. We'll do the right things. We'll do what's good. But He's also saying that God's Spirit is protecting us. He's protecting us. He's protecting us. He has us in His hand. John 14, Jesus says, Nothing can pluck you from my hand. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, we are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's basically God, through the work of His Spirit, is protecting us, but also God's Spirit, through God's Spirit, He is fulfilling God's plans and purposes in our lives. He's orchestrating everything that happens is going to fulfill God's purposes. And that's what we recognize. God has promised that His Spirit is prompting, is protecting and is bringing about his plans and purposes for our lives. And we have that assurance. We have that sense of hope. And, and no separation. I will never be separated from the love of God, which is demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And therefore, his spirit who lives inside of me is prompting me. The spirit is, is protecting me. The spirit is providing in my life God's plans and purposes to be worked out. But we also see we're in that orchestration. God is orchestrating all things. No separation. God is orchestrating that all things that take place in our lives, they, they will bring about what's good for us, for those who love Him, and will bring about good for the sake of God's glory. God's glory is seen through God's sovereign power, through God's spiritual activities in this world, and God is working things all out for what's best for us. God has a plan for us. Our days are numbered. Our lives are, are, are in God's hand. And we can trust God orchestrates all things to work together for what's best. But the question is, do we trust Him? Do we follow Him? Do we submit to him? That's the question mark. And it's important that we realize that. It's all for the sake of his glory. But you know what we have to understand here, as we look at this passage, is that there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Notice what it says here. It says, Who can bring a charge against God's elect? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things. God orchestrates all things for what's best, for what's good. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who also was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, will famine, will nakedness, or peril, or sword? For just as it is written, for, our, for your sake, 
We are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are overwhelming, we overwhelmingly conquer. We are victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love. But the question is, am I trusting him? Am I following after him? his guidelines through the through the the work of the holy spirit but the thing is is we have this promise god's plans and purposes are for our ultimate good god's plans and purposes are for our ultimate good god is working out all things god orchestrates all things for what's best and the holy spirit who indwells our lives is the is the guidance and the direction that he gives us along with his word. And as I look at today's applications and consider just some various things, this is the same thing I put up at the beginning where we realize God gave all faithful followers of Christ, all faithful followers of Christ, God gave his spirit to provide for us security, to provide for us strength, to provide for us supervision, to provide for us stability. Now, as we look at that, where's my security? Is my security in the Holy Spirit? Is my security in God's promises? Is my security in what Christ has done for me? Or am I trying to do things in some self-sufficient, self-satisfying way that says, hey, look what I did. Look at how much good I've done, or look at all the things I've accomplished. Am I at the center of that perspective, or is Christ at the center, or is the Holy Spirit at the center? Do I look to God's Holy Spirit to give me that sense of security? Do I look to God's Holy Spirit to give me the strength I need? I've tried witnessing before. I've tried to do it on my own strength. And I've made a fool of myself. I've tried to do many things. I, I've, I've, by God's grace, I've very rarely, if ever, gotten into the pulpit looking at my ability or my strength. In fact, I know I'm not a speaker by nature. I, as a young, young child, as a, as a uh, student in school, speech class or whatever else, I avoided being in front of people. But yet, when God gives me his word to explain and to express, I have a sense of confidence, not in me, but in God's spirit, because God's spirit gives me the strength. God's spirit gives you the strength that you need to be able to witness to somebody, to be able to tell somebody about Jesus, to be able to say no to something that you ought to say, no, I shouldn't be doing this. God's spirit gives you the strength. God's Spirit gives us the supervision. He's watching over our lives. He lives inside of us, but He's supervising. <clears throat> he's guiding us. He's prompting us. He's telling us to go to bed when we should go to bed. He's, <clears throat> he's telling us to read our Bibles when we should read our Bibles. He's telling us to attend or not to attend this function or this church activity. God's Holy Spirit supervises our lives. Am I submitting to the supervision of God's Spirit? Do I read God's Word and see the instructions that God gives and the Spirit is going to supervise me as I follow those instructions? Or am I trying to do things that I want to do? Am I trying to follow my own agenda? And finally, stability. God's Spirit provides for us stability. We talk about the insecurities, we talk about the fears, we talk about all the various things that happen. We talk about the idea of fretting over what's going on in the world around us. Let's realize that stability comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, John chapter 14, my peace I give to you, not peace like what the world expects to have. I give you peace, peace that will carry you through, peace that will comfort you. Philippians chapter 4, anxious, worried, fretting, don't be anxious, it says, but in everything, let your requests be made known to God, and he will give you peace that will overcome that sense of affliction, that sense of anxiety, that sense of anger, that sense of angst. He will give you peace that overcomes those things. It's all through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us stability. And I want us to realize God's Holy Spirit is sometimes, sadly enough, something that we ignore. In fact, I had some quotes. I was going to read these at the beginning. I'm going to conclude with these. A.W. Tozer makes a statement. Most of the time, we are too much influenced by the world around us and too little controlled by God's Spirit. That's a sad truth. Or Erwin Lutzer says, you become stronger only when you become weaker. When we say, I need your spirit, I need your help, I need your strength, God, my, I'm weak in my own. Whenever you surrender your will to God and his Holy Spirit, you discover the resources to do what God requires. But it's only through surrendering to God's will, surrendering to, surrendering to God's spirit, and finally, Warren Wiersbe says, It's futile for us to try to serve God without the power of the Holy Spirit. Talent, training, experience can never take the place of the power of God's Spirit. And it's important for us to realize that every single hour, every day, we need God's His security. We need His strength. We need His supervision. And we need his stability. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of us to give us those wonderful blessings. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I realize that as I express a message like this on video, I, I walk away wondering, well, did I say what I needed to say? Did I do what I needed to do? Father, I, I pray right now, uh, take me out of the picture. Take me out of the perspective that it's, it's not me, Father. It's what you are saying to people through the truths you've placed into my heart, into my mind, into my life. It's you that's at work through the power of your Spirit. Your Spirit gives us security. We can think we have all the security from our finances, from our locks on our doors, from all the things that, that, that we have around us that provide security, but no. Father, you're the number one source of security through your Spirit. You give us that sense of strength we need. We are weak ourselves, and when we become weak, when we experience, when we recognize our weakness, Father, we are given your strength, and we thank you. You supervise us through the ministry of your Spirit. Your Spirit convicts us of things we do that we shouldn't. Your Spirit tries to stop us from doing things that we shouldn't do. Your Spirit supervises, and we thank you for that. And finally, Father, your Spirit gives us that sense of stability. We can stand strong because of the Spirit. We can serve you because of the Spirit. We can honor you because of the Spirit. We can obey you because of the Spirit. Thank you for that, Father. I pray for any special needs that are represented within our church family. I pray for special needs for those that are listening and watching. And I ask your blessing today as we look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit and realize that's what we need. Thank you. I love you. I praise you. I ask your blessings, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for being part of our fellowship. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Pray for us. Pray for the, the, the ministries of our church, our annual meetings a week from Sunday on the 23rd. And I, I just ask your prayers. I ask your support because we need each other. We're family. We're in this thing together. And with the Spirit 
binding us together and working in us, we can accomplish great things. Thanks, Lord bless. Hope to see you soon. I'm praying for you. Thank you for your prayers for me and for Donna too. Lord bless.